All right, awesome. So you should have primary color paints. We have blue, yellow, red, black, and white. And to get the in-between colors, I'm gonna teach you how to mix those. I have a 16 by 20 canvas in our kits. Um, they're 12 by 16, but I do need to have mine a little bigger so I can show you, um, so you can see it well. I'm only gonna use a few different brushes. I'm gonna use a large flat, a medium flat, and a small round. But use whatever brush seems to feel comfortable in your hand for that step. Um, because there are lots of brushes that might work for particular things. But I'll tell you what I'm gonna use. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover our canvas with water. The reason we do that is that here in Denver, it's very dry. And especially when the heat's on and my goodness, this time of year and especially this weekend, the heat is just running nonstop. So we're just gonna cover our canvas with some water and that's gonna make it so that the paint moves smoothly across the canvas. The paints we're using are acrylic paints and acrylic paints are made out of water and crushed up pigment like a, a dye and then uh, also a binder, which is kind of like glue. And so it will dry and it dries quickly. It dries in about five to 10 minutes if you put on a thin layer, which is really great. When the masters in Europe painted the, uh, the masterpieces, those were with oil paints and they took weeks or months of years to cure. They don't really dry ever, but they cure. And ours are gonna be done in minutes. So that's cool. We're lucky that way. So just go ahead and make sure there's a little water on your canvas, doesn't have to be dripping doesn't have to be perfect, just to help us keep our paints thin and smooth. I'm enjoying a cup of tea. I don't know what you're enjoying. You might be having wine or uh, <laughs> with this weather hot soup, who knows? I'm drinking hot tea. Uh, but whatever you're drinking, cheers. Cheers to everyone being here. Good. So everyone hopefully has some water on their canvas. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up a little bit of white paint on my biggest flat brush, see that? And then I'm gonna streak it back and forth. So this is horizontal, just wiping white paint. And you might ask, we have a white canvas, why would you put white paint on a white canvas? And that's a very good question. The reason I'm doing it is that when I put my blue on top of that to make my sky, it will mix with the white in those stripes, in those streaks, and it will give me a more streaky, cloudy look in my sky. So without even washing my brush, I went ahead and I picked up some blue paint as well. And then I can streak that on too. And it will mix with the white paint and I wanna let those streaks happen, okay? Don't blend all your streaks away. And we're gonna go down about halfway down the painting. Halfway down with white streaks and blue streaks. And we're just gonna let those streaks have fun and mingle together. Pretend it's a party and you want all your friends to mingle, okay? Okay. And you can pick up a drop of water in your jar like that and then shake it off, jar, or container, whatever you have it in. And, whoops. and a drop of water will help your paint stay thin. If you put, if you don't knock it off in the jar enough, you will get streaks. I just got a streak, but that's okay. Just wipe it off if you get that, no problem. But a drop of water here and there is a really helpful thing to keep your paint thin on your background, okay? So sometimes I'm gonna pick up white, sometimes I'm gonna pick up blue, and I just wanna have both of them coexisting and mixing and just having a good old time together, but I don't wanna blend them 
to one shade of blue. I want streaks. Keep it streaky. Okay? Friends don't let friends over blend. Keep it streaky. And that's how you get those wispy horizontal clouds by keeping it streaky. I like to step back about five feet and see what I've done um, after each major step. Just because you can always see it better from a distance. My philosophy is the painting of painting is like raising kids. And you need, you need to have regular breaks. You need to step back. You need a little distance somehow so you can really see what what you're doing and you appreciate it your painting and your kids your family so much more when you have little breaks right so step back see it from a distance and you'll come back and love it even more right i had a class of teenagers and i said oh definitely true with parents too so we're just creating some thin uh, clouds and a blue sky and not blending it all together. And we're going halfway down. Okay, wonderful. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a small brush, like a small round brush. And a round brush basically means when you put your hand on that metal piece just below the bristles and you spin it in your hand, it just feels round. And what I'm going to do is I'll dip my round brush in the water and then I'll use it to stir my black paint a little bit just so I get some black paint on. And I'm going to use this round brush and the black paint like a pencil. So what we're going to do, go ahead and mute if you will. What we're going to do is I'm going to draw on the mountains in the back with this fine brush and black paint. So the, the first mountain is going to be about one quarter of the way down the canvas. So if you are lucky enough to have a teacher like Mrs. Lovely, then a quarter is going to be easy. But if it's not, that's okay. I'm going to explain. So first we'll divide it in half, right? Just with our arm, just to get an idea. And then half again, right? All right. And then we'll put a dot right about there. This is kind of the center of my canvas this way. And then I'm going to, from that dot, I'm going to pull all the way down to the side of the canvas, just above the corner. And then I'm going to come down about halfway on this side. So on the left side, it was only halfway. On the right side, it was from that dot all the way down to just above the corner. And if yours isn't exactly like mine, it doesn't really matter. No one's ever going to see the original. They're just going to see yours and they're going to think you're a genius. And then on this right side, I'm gonna go about a third of the way down. So divide it in three with my eyes. One, two, three. So about a third of the way down, right to about there. And I'm gonna wiggle up and make another mountain off to the side. And when I say wiggly, anytime you, you make a line in nature, it's good to have it wiggly because nothing in nature is straight. Nature makes a lot of curvy lines. People will tell us, oh, I'm not a very good artist because I can't draw a straight line. Well, you know, we almost never draw a straight line. And when we do, we use a ruler. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work with our finger. We'll figure out on this, this left side about where we'd want to start another mountain because there's a row of three. I'll come down a little bit lower than the peak of this one 
just so everything's not the same. And I'm gonna make a line that connects with the bottom of that one. And I'm just gonna pull it down. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. So now what we have is the mountain in the front. Well, uh, the first one, and then one off the side that we put on just with a line, and then this one. So basically that's the back, that's the middle, that's the front. So it's like a stack of mountains. And if yours doesn't look like mine, remember, don't worry, well, don't worry. As long as you have three, that's all that matters. All right, here's the last thing, okay? And I can repeat this if anyone is, didn't catch part of it, but I'll just go ahead and give the last part for these black lines, okay? I am going to make a Harry Potter scar or a lightning bolt, whatever you wanna call that, line down the center of this middle mountain. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So the reason we made this line down the middle of this mountain is it's just dividing the bright side from the shady side. So every mountain, depending on where the sun is, right? Um, if the sun is not perfectly overhead, if it's off to one side or the other, the side that it's on is going to create a brighter side on the mountain, right? The sunlight will reflect off the snow and make a brighter side. If the sun's over here, this would be the brighter side. If the sun's over here, this would be the brighter side. I'm just gonna make an executive decision. I'm gonna call on mine, the brighter side over here. But depending on what yours looks like, you can do whatever you want. You could do either side, but one's gonna be brighter and one's gonna be shadier, okay? And so the way I'm gonna do that is with a medium brush and some white paint, I'm going to pull down inside these lines some white streaks, but I'm not going to, this is on the brighter side, I'm not going to cover up all the blue and I'm not going to make it solid. I just want some white streaks in there. Not perfect. Nothing we're going to do here today is perfect, okay? All right, good. So just some white streaks. And then I'm going to, with my brush, pick up just the teeniest, tiniest amount of yellow. And I'm gonna pull on some yellow streaks. Now, why would I have yellow on a mountain? I'll tell you. This is the bright side, right? So it's nice and bright. Which is more to do with the, uh, Oh, by the way, try to avoid any wet spots on your black paint. If your lines are still wet of your black paint, you'll know that because they'll be shiny. So avoid doing this until your black paint is no longer shiny. If it's still shiny, just sit back and watch and wait, okay? All right, when it's not shiny, that means it's dry, and then we could do this. Mine was pretty dry. So then I can take some blue paint and I can stripe in some just kind of sporadically onto that bright side. So basically I'm making green by going over some of the yellow, but it's all very stripey. Why would a mountain have a stripey surface? I'll tell you, streaky is really the good word, is a good word for that, because there's all these indentations in a mountain, like caves and um, look, recessed points, like if you're a skier, moguls, right? And so you paint those by just having different shades of paint and different colors. Also, snow on a mountain reflects light. And so whatever colors are in the environment around the mountain, they're gonna be reflected in the light of the snow. 
This is a very impressionistic painting and impressionistic paintings don't look exactly real, right? Monet was an impressionistic painter and so was Van Gogh and their work didn't look exactly real. It, it looked colorful and imperfect. And I'll be honest with you, I saw um, uh, Monet's and Van Gogh's up close in Paris and they look terrible from a, uh, you know, a foot away, they look terrible. But you get back five feet, 10 feet, 15, 20 feet, they look amazing. Uh, and impressionistic paintings are like that, okay? So I have some white, I have some blue, and I have a little yellow, and it's just making all these nice little happy streaks. Now mine's quite a bit more yellow than that one. So I might come in with a little more white, a little more blue, But where they're mixing, they're making green, and I'm happy with that. And again, I'm using a medium brush. Use whatever size brush feels good for you, to you. And if you uh, go over those black lines a bit, it's okay. It's okay. The mountains could be separated by the angle of the pulls. We're pulling down with the slope of the mountain here. See that? We're not going back and forth like this. We're pulling down, just like we're skiing down or snowmobiling down, snowmobiling. Sorry, that's Michigan talk for you, for Michigan. Uh, skiing down or <laughs> sledding down or snowshoeing down, that's what I meant to say. All right. So we're pulling down in the direction you would ski down the hill, and in my case, fall down the hill. If you have questions, go ahead and unmute to ask your questions. Just make sure that you don't blend it all into one color, okay? If you're, uh, this is interesting. In the last five years that I've owned the studio, what I notice is people who are really, really good at finance, uh, um, or at um, engineering or creating schedules for other people, any kind of real detailed work, they tend to overblend. Okay. So if you're painting with someone who, who does overblending, just, you know, be a friend. Friends don't let friends overblend. Okay. If we already just, overblended, what do we do? Yeah, that's okay. Just go ahead in and put more streaks. It's funny, I notice moms who are, have really clean houses, they also overblend. Yeah. I think it has something to do with like wanting to make everything perfect, you know? Some of us, that's just how we are. I have to stop myself from overblending. You wanna see all the different colors in there, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and tell you the other side so then you can unmute and visit while you paint, okay? The other side is gonna be the same thing with this exception. We're gonna pull down in the other direction. So this way we pull down the way we would ski or fall. This way we're gonna pull down the way we would ski or fall on the other side of the mountain. And the only difference on this side is we're gonna use more blue because this side, the left side, is the shadier side of the mountain. So more blue over here. And if you want to go ahead and unmute and visit, feel free.
Just be sure, don't make it all the same color, okay? Don't blend it all away. And here's how you know if you've made it, um, if you're keeping it streaky enough, stand back about five feet. Go to the other side of the room and ask yourself, did I leave it streaky enough? Do I need to put more streaks in? Because this painting, the original has a lot of streaks. It's basically all just streaks. And the streaks are what show the bear caves and the forests and all kinds of snow. Maybe there's little avalanches in there. We don't know. But if we don't have streaks, we won't have that interesting texture and all that detail. I have a question for the kids who are painting for, with us, okay? So if this is the bright side and this is the shady side, who can tell me what this side would be? Bright or shady? Pro I'm gonna go ahead and say it because I didn't hear anyone. Probably more shady on this side. Probably more shady. So on this other mountain, I'm pulling down the shady sideway, making it more blue and stopping where this one starts. To make long lines or short lines, whatever, whatever works. Just keep that motion of the direction that you're pulling in. Because that's the way I would ski down. And you can see now by having a bright side and a shady side with brush strokes pulled down in different directions, it looks more now like my painting is more three-dimensional. Hopefully you can see that. Everybody's so quiet now, such hard workers. And if you over blend, reason, just go back, go ahead. The only reason we're quiet is because we're muted and we're trying to keep up with you because you're so fast. <laughs> I'm gonna slow down and you guys will have lots and lots of time to do this, okay? I just wanna make sure I'm ahead of anybody. I'm gonna just tell you this one more side, okay? And then I'm gonna be quiet for like 10 minutes to let you guys catch up, okay? This last side, in this painting, they made it shady. And I'll tell you why they did. Because they wanted your attention on the mountains in the middle. That was deliberate. This is the focal point. So sometimes artists do that. They do things that don't make sense to direct your eye. Wanna know what else they did? It's kind of fun. They put this uh, aspen tree at an angle that matches this slope. Again, telling you, I want you to pay attention to this mountain. Isn't that funny? And then these aspen trees frame this central mountain. So and even this foothill is like an arrow pointing to this central mountain. So this artist did everything but scream, look here. Isn't that interesting how you can do that with composition and angles? So on this side, you can do it however you want. You can do it the logical way where it's brighter, or you can do it the shady way, which draws attention to the focal point. This one, you do you, okay? We'll come back and put a foothill later. But this one, you do it however you want. So now I'm gonna give you 10 minutes to just catch up, and just paint, and I'll be here if you need me, okay? And we won't start till everybody says they're good.
So just relax. Now, if you wanted one other idea that's kind of fun is you could pick a tiny bit of red up on your brush and you could even on this one, you could put a little red. I would not recommend adding any red to a mountain that has yellow in it and blue because if you mix red and yellow and blue, you get brown and we wanna avoid brown. I want to add a little pink you could on this one. But this one is your your decision, your fun, your choice. Don't forget when you, after you fill them in, whenever that will be, step back and look at it from five feet away at least, okay? Because then you'll know if you want to tweak anything. It's interesting. These mountains just might be all snow, but in the snow, they're just like, we don't paint snow white. We have all of these colors because these are all reflections of things in the environment, the sky, and maybe some trees in the forests, a little detail of it. A little indent, the blue can be little indentations, little caves. Um, there might be some bears living in here, we don't know. And so we can't paint all those little tiny details. So by just putting in all these different colors, it creates the texture, uh, interesting texture. And looks funny from close up. Mine looks really funny from close up, but from a distance, that's all that matters. So that's why we step back five or 10 feet so we can see what we've done, what we've created. I keep changing my mind about what I want done with this side. <laughs> That's okay, that's the beauty of painting, is you can change your mind. Just let it dry and then paint over it. Use white, just like you would correction fluid on, if you're writing a letter to somebody and, and not that we all write letters anymore, but if you're sending something in the mail and make a mistake, you use a little bottle of correction fluid to change it. You can use white the same way, exactly the same way. Just let it dry. Whatever you did, just let it dry. Put some white on it. Paint it again. That's why I love acrylic paint. I, I do paint with, uh, we do paint with watercolors sometimes here at the studio. We do paint with um, Bob Ross oils. I really love acrylic because it's so easy to dry. It's so easy to fix. Mm -hmm. All right, so I do want you guys to stand back and look at yours from five feet. If you haven't already, please, please, please do that, okay? It's not just a nice thing to say, it's for real. Stand back, get up, stand back, look at yours from five feet away. You will be surprised how different yours looks from a distance than if you've had your nose in it the whole time. Here's another thing. Um, so they did research on what uh, 
you know, what factors contribute to creativity. And these are some of the things that they learn. Uh, one, as you know, little alcohol never hurt, uh, but also movement, right? And so if you get up and move your body, you will open up creative, uh, your creative mind more. It actually has that effect on your brain. So get up and move, look at your painting from a distance, see what you think from a distance, okay? And then uh, what else? Um, humor, sorry, I'm not that funny, but you know, a uh, little funny looking. Um, so uh, keep your brain hydrated. So if you're drinking alcohol, have some water too, right? Um, Excuse me, Nancy. What color are you painting with now? And where did all this <laughs> come from? <laughs> I know I've been going back and forth. I just put more blue on because I couldn't decide. But here's the thing, we're gonna frame in, we're gonna put trees here, so it doesn't really matter. Mostly I just want this to be the star of the show. I'm gonna go ahead and show you the next thing that's super easy, okay guys? This is easy. Do you see there's a little foothill in here? See that? Little foothill. So I'm gonna make my little foothill just by putting a little white paint on my biggest brush. And I'm just gonna make a little hill, just kind of quick and random. Little hill, right? Little hill down at the bottom. Not covering up a ton of my mountain, but just some of it. And because some of my paint is wet, it's already mixing and that's, that's just a bonus. That's a happy accident. But then with that big brush, I'm just gonna mix a tiny bit of blue, a tiny bit of yellow, to make a little green. And then I'm just gonna put it in here. This is just gonna be a little foothill down, down at the bottom. And the foothill is in front of the mountains, just down here at the bottom, just a little foothill. The reason we're putting on a little foothill is at the end, we're gonna put some wildflowers on it. So that'll be give us a nice little hill to put our wildflowers on. Just light green at the bottom. Did that by first putting on the little hill in white, then a little yellow and blue mixed and made a soft little green foothill down here where we can put our wildflowers at the end. Just like that one. Mine's a little flatter and wider and that one's taller, it doesn't really matter. Everyone's painting's gonna be different at the end and that's what we want. The idea is not to have carbon copies of each other's paintings. That's kind of boring, right? We wanna see your personality in your painting. I never paint anything that's exactly the same as the original artist. We have about 500 paintings here and we paint our, each other's work all the time. And mine never looks like the original artist and theirs don't look like mine and that's great. And yours are, aren't gonna look like either one of these. Um, I don't think, but uh, the basic idea is we just wanna see your personality come out in your painting. So I clean my brushes and I'm just uh, tapping them on the napkins to make sure they're clean. And uh, let me tell you about these aspen trees we're gonna do. So I went to the Cherry Creek Arts Festival about 10 years, no, not 10 years, five years ago with my husband. And uh, we saw this huge painting, it was like seven feet by 10 feet and they wanted $10,000 for it. And basically it was just aspen trees. And I looked at it and uh, I could see how they did it. They did it with a knife. And uh, basically my husband said, uh, you could do that. Let's, why don't we just paint our garage door and you could sell that, but uh, we didn't. Anyway, I'm gonna show you $10,000 Aspen trees and you don't have to pay me a penny to do it, okay? Well, I'm already paid. So um, these are our $10,000 Aspen trees, okay? You're not gonna believe how easy these are. So I'm gonna take my biggest brush, I'm gonna paint my three big ones with the biggest flat brush I have. 
and I'm going to dip it in white paint. I'm going to get white paint on both sides of my biggest flat brush. Okay. Now, trees are wider at the base than they are at, in the sky, right? Because they grow from the ground up and they get thinner as they go up because those that area is not as tall, I mean, as uh, old. So I'm going to put the first one over here, the one behind it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do it by starting at the base of my canvas to the right of this mountain, but overlapping yes. it a little. Okay, so right about there, that's where it's going to go. And I'm going to start at the base and press hard at the base, press hard, because that's where it's going to be the fattest. And as I go up, I'm going to press lighter and lighter. I can even give it a little tiny bit of a twist on my brush so it's skinnier at the top. And if you want, you could go over that again, press real hard at the base so it's nice and fat, and then it's going to get thinner as you go up. And if it's not straight, congratulations, that's even better. We don't want anything too straight or too perfect. It won't look good. Okay, so that's the first one. And don't worry if you can see a little bit of the painting behind it, especially up near the top. It doesn't matter. We're going to put highlights and scars on it. So don't worry. Be happy. And on the other side, about in the same place, maybe, yeah, about in the same place. Let's do another one. Real fat at the bottom, real hold, press hard at the bottom, lighter as you go up. Give it a tiny bit of a, like a quarter inch twist. It'll just make it a little thinner as you go up. Here's what I mean by a twist. So there's the fat part, right? Here's what I mean by the twist. I'm twisting my brush just a tiny bit. See that? Just a tiny bit, about a quarter turn. So it gets thinner as I go up. Is my tree perfect? Heck no, I don't care. The bumpier and the more wiggly and imperfect it is, pretty much that's even better. Because real trees have all kinds of scars. Maybe at one point, you know, there was bad weather or a bear climbed on it or a human climbed on it, broke some branches off, we don't know. So the more bumpy and wiggly and crooked that is, the better. I'm looking out the window, it's snowing while I'm drinking my cold drink. I'm wishing it were a hot toddy. I'm going to put one more on with this big brush and it's going to go just like my brush is right now. See how that is? It's going to run parallel to the slope of the mountain, but it's going to cross over the one I did before. Okay, like that. So I'm going to start on the side, pressing really hard at the base, and then going up and twist my brush a quarter turn just to make it a little smaller as it goes up. This one's starting right off the canvas, crossing and going up. The reason why that's crossing, a couple of reasons. One, sometimes trees are falling, right? Um, you know, on a hill or a mountain, they start to fall over, but it also could be a really fat branch of a tree that's split. We don't really know the story of that one, but it looks pretty natural that way. I don't expect you to be where I am because I know you're probably filling it in. Don't worry, it doesn't have to be perfect. I am gonna show you the location of the other ones I'm gonna do, and then you can go back and tweak all you want, okay? I'm gonna use for my smaller branches, my smaller trees rather, I'm gonna use a smaller flat brush. 
because this one, which is gonna go next to this one, is skinnier, it's younger. So this one, again, pressing hard at the base and then lighter as I go up. This is a younger tree, so it's not as fat. It's still tall, it goes all the way up, but it's thinner. That's this one. And this is just straight on white. And then this one is interesting off to the side. And then I'm going to get let you catch up, okay? But I'm just telling you where they are. This one is skinnier still. I'm going to have to use the side of a medium brush or a really small flat brush. But it splits. Do you see that? It starts down here and then it splits and it turns into a Y, like a Y. That one's kind of fun. I'm going to put that one over here. So I'm going to start at the base and then it's going to split. That one's kind of fun. It helps if you say All right, now I'll let you catch up to that. Let me know if you have any questions. Notice how now those two side mountains really don't even matter. We're gonna be putting branches and foliage. This is the star of the show, the one in the center. And then I'm going to show you a card trick. If it's easier to make the two sides of this tree that breaks into a Y um, with a small brush, go ahead and use a small brush. Use whatever size makes sense to you, depending on the size of the object you're painting, okay? And don't worry if this is not perfect. Again, we're going to be color covering um, these trees with highlights and shadows, and we do want to let this white dry some. And I think it actually looks better if they're not perfect. Mm -hmm. They're bumpy and streaky. I think they look better uh, because we're gonna put the scars and the highlights on it and it's it, even it's better when it's not perfect. perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While you're getting those white trunks on, I'm going to show you something else. And if you're not there yet, don't worry, okay? Just for people who are, <clears throat> I'm going to take a small round brush and black paint. And I'm going to make branches coming off of my trees. And I'm going to keep them wiggly. And I'm always going to start on the tree trunk and then go in the sky. And I'll tell you why. If you start in the sky and come down, th then it's going to look more like a cactus. Okay. 
because when you touch your paint, your uh, canvas with your brush, wherever you touch it first has more paint. So I'm gonna touch harder at, at the side of the tree, the trunk, and then less uh, pressure as I go out and then kind of flick up. And that gives me pointier stem ends, or not stem, branch ends. So I'm gonna do a few in black on each tree. Keep them wiggly, always start from the trunk and go out. Wiggly looks more realistic than straight. I'm gonna put a few on each tree and then, then I'm gonna put some in another color too. And I'm gonna put a few on each tree. Keep them wiggly, keep them gnarly. Some at the bottom, some at the top. Always start on the trunk. Unless you want a cactus, then you do you. We're gonna put in this, I'm gonna show you how to put in the shadows and the scars. Don't do that yet, okay? When I'm done with the black, I'm just gonna mix a little bit of black and a little bit of gray. Sorry, a little bit of black and a little bit of white to make it gray on the same little brush. And then I'm gonna use that gray to put in a few branches, a couple branches maybe on each tree in gray. And that's just adding a little variety. And you could have the branches come off of other branches if you want, but now we're just using gray. It's just adding another little element and texture with another color. Gives it some variety. Always start on the trunk, wiggle out. You can even use it to branch off of other branches. But same thing, just in gray. Just so there's variety of colors and shades in those branches. Some black, some gray. And if it mixes a little with my black, even better. That's cool. Keep them wiggly. I always get super excited when we're gonna put the scars on the trees. Cause you guys are gonna love this stuff. You're gonna go, ooh, ah.
All right, I don't expect you to be done, don't panic. But I do wanna tell you that when you're finished with your branches, what I want you to do is find a little piece of cardboard somewhere in your house. You can use a business card. You could use the flap from your pizza box, that little rectangular flap where it closes. But as long as you have a little piece of cardboard, that's what we're gonna to use to scar up our trees. I call that my card trick. And basically what we're gonna do is, um, uh, artists frequently paint aspen and birch trees, which this could be either, with a knife. But we don't need a knife. We can just use a little piece of cardboard. This is a business card. So go ahead and either find a business card that you don't need or a little piece of cardboard. Paper would be too flexible. If you have an artist knife and you wanna do that, you can do that. But all you need is a little piece of cardboard. Could be a little, any piece. And I want one side that is flat. Doesn't have to be very big, can be small, like a business card. Could even be a half of a business card, that works. Or a flap from your pizza box. I'm gonna go ahead and show you the scars on the trees. And if you're not ready, don't worry. I just wanna to keep to my timeline, but I have all the time in the world after if you wanna tweak and finish later, but I'll just make sure I can show you the steps in case anyone has to go pick up a child from a babysitter or something. All right, so got my flat edge from a little piece of cardboard. I'm going to just dip it just the edge, just a little bit. See that? Little edge of black paint. And then I'm going to steady my hand. I can do that with a clean finger on a dry part of the painting. And I'm going to touch it to that side of the aspen tree or birch tree and pull across. See how that makes really cool stars, uh, scars? Isn't that cool? Here's where you say, ooh, ah. Feel free to unmute and say, ooh, ah. So I'm just pulling that with that little piece of cardboard across and making scars. Ooh, ah. And you could do it from the other side too. And each time you press, depending on how much pressure you put on it, you'll put more or less paint on. Does it have to be perfect? No, it's better if it's not perfect. Is it okay if it covers up some of your branches? Sure, it's all right. It's an impressionistic painting. Now right there, I have too much black. So all I have to do, dip that little flat edge in white and I could go over it again. Not only does it cover up some of the black, it makes a really cool gray. Ooh, ah. And it's just a piece of garbage cardboard. If there's uh, somebody that sends you a lot of junk mail and you have a piece of cardboard from them, It'll be very satisfying to use their junk mail by tearing it up and using it in your painting. Hey, 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 Cody and Bailey, it's it's with a certain sadness I tell you we've ripped up your cards and we're using them. <laughs> but we did note the phone numbers first. Oh, <laughs> did we 
the same thing. <laughs> Cody and Bailey, you may want to put your number again in the chat. So this is exactly what the $10,000 Aspen trees look like. They just did it with a knife. I could tell by looking at it. You don't need a knife if you have a business card. Just be careful on these little trees that you don't pull farther than the tree is wide. Be careful, slow and careful. Like I said, if there's any area that's too black, just dip it again in the white and you can pull right across it with a little white. And that's even cooler because you get this mix of colors, mix of white and gray and black, which is really cool. I think making aspen and birch trees are my very favorite thing to do as an artist. People are so impressed. Don't tell them our secret, okay? When someone looks at your painting, just tell them that you had a little tiny brush and that took all day. And that you were working from a photo and the real tree looks exactly like that. Once again, you can pull from both sides or just one side, you decide. And all we have to do are some wildflowers and we're gonna have a completed painting. Woohoo! And I'll show you how to do those in just a minute. All right, so the wildflowers are super easy. All we're gonna do is remember that green that we made to make our hill? We're going to take a tiny brush and a little bit of that green, if you don't have any, it's just a little, a mix of a little yellow and a little blue, makes green. And we're just gonna put on some dots or scribbles on the hill where we wanna put some wildflowers. So that's basically the greenery underneath the wildflowers. So dots or scribbles either work wherever you're gonna be putting your colorful wildflowers. So these are the little patches of them. Wildflowers tend to grow in patches. So I'll just put a few dots there, a few dots here. I'm not gonna put them all over on my hill because again, wildflowers tend to grow in patches, right? So then I'll clean my little brush again and I'm gonna put on dots just dots of alternating colors, red. These are the blossoms. I'm not making perfect leaves and stems. I'm just putting on little dots. And these dots are the, uh, the blossoms of the wildflowers. And I'm trying not to go directly on top of the green. You can let that dry, the green dry or you can just go around them or above them. So first I'm using red, then I'm gonna clean my brush and I'm gonna go back in and do the same thing with yellow. So these wildflowers are yellow. 
and red. If you want, you can mix a little white with some blue and make blue ones, whatever, whatever kind of wildflowers you like, okay? Whatever is growing in your imagination on the top of your mountains, okay? So a little yellow, a little red, pops, and if the yellow and the red mix together, cool, even better. Then you have orange ones too. They had babies. You could even do a few, like I said, some blue ones or some white ones. Do whatever colors you like in your wildflowers. I don't think there are any mountains in Texas that I know of, but they have beautiful bluebells. They're just pretty blue flowers. Why not? This is your painting. Make it whatever you want. Make it a make-believe place if you want. Your call, you're painting your call. So these are just little dots. Not a lot of detail. No stems, just dots. White, yellow, red, whatever color you want. Just do, do me a favor, make sure you don't mix your colors, the red and blue and yellow together or you'll have brown. All right, that's the end of my painting. I have little wildflower patches there, which are kind of fun. I might, now that this is drawing a bit, I might come in and put a few more on top of that green in the middle. But you get the general idea. I got hills, I got mountains, I got trees, I got wildflowers. And now I'm just gonna use my tiny little brush and whatever paint you wanna do and sign it in the bottom right-hand corner. Can you quickly show us how to do leaves? Oh yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, I was trying to keep on, on the, the schedule and I forgot the leaves, sorry. Yeah, leaves are easy. It's the same thing as we did for the wildflowers, but we're gonna use a slightly bigger brush, okay? Don't use your tiniest brush, use a medium brush, a medium round or a medium flat, either will do. And all we're gonna do is pick up yellow paint and we're just gonna dab it on in little dabs. And then we'll do the same thing with green. So we have two layers of color. Notice I'm not dabbing it on exactly on the branch only. I'm dabbing it around the branches as well as on top of them because there are probably little teeny twigs that are connecting these uh, sorry leaves to the branches, but they're so little we can't see them. Um, if I don't explain that, sometimes in the studio I've had people who, um, they'll put their leaves right on top of the branch like a row of ladybugs. We wanna have them looser than that, off into the sky around the branches. And that's just suggesting that there are tiny little twigs or stems that you can't see holding them on. So some will go over the branches right on top, some will go around it, just in little clusters. So that's the yellow. I'm gonna put it yellow around each one, put as many or as few as you want. Just knowing that you'll be covering up some of your hard work from earlier if you put on a ton of them. But your call. And then I'm gonna come back in with green. And I don't even have to clean my brush in between the yellow and the green because the two together play really nice together. And they'll create varieties in the shades of green. So there's my yellow and I'll come back in and do some more yellow, but I'll show you with the green too. I'll just go ahead and put a little more yellow. Then I'll switch to my green. A little bit more yellow, pop, pop, pop. Just around the branches, just around. There's the yellow and now the green. And they just play nice together. They're friends. And then if you wanted it to be fall instead of spring, you could add orange or red. But here's the thing, these are wildflowers. They tend to come in the spring. So just keep that in mind, but it's your painting, your creativity, you decide. You see how that yellow and the green are mixing nicely together? So if I accidentally hit a yellow one with my green, it's a bonus because it just looks cool together too.
All right. So signature ghost in the bottom right hand corner. Thank you so much for painting with me.